My name is Elena Kolarska. I'm on the DiGrid open source team. Um, uh, in like, so I've been doing uh, some work on the actor subsystem in Dapper for the past few months, I would say, recently. And since actors can be a relatively abstract uh, concept that sometimes is maybe not that intuitive to, to understand, I thought that I would uh, share my uh, understandings and my journey with you. Hopefully that uh, maybe that helps you to, to see the beauty of dapper actors and uh, hopefully even uh, you start using them in some of your projects. So... Let's start with a very high level, let's even call it a theoretical definition. What is an actor? An actor would be a primitive in the domain of uh, computer and computation, were defined by a few properties. So an actor can have uh, behavior, can have state, and it can communicate uh, with other actors. And I understand this is a very generic definition. It could be describing me or my dog or even my Wi-Fi router uh, on good dates the day is when it decides to cooperate, which, by the way, fingers crossed, uh, is going to be a good, a good day today because I'm in a hotel. Um, but also, apart from that, uh, it sounds awfully a lot like the object-oriented programming model, doesn't it? So if we look at it more closely, and I'm going to be, use Dapper, I'm going to be using Dapper terminology here, but uh, we're going to explain in a moment what uh, uh, that means exactly. We can compare a class to an actor type. Uh, that's where the behavior is defined, right? We could compare an object, uh, like so an instantiated class, to an actor instance or an actor ID. That's the terminology we use in Dapper. And... Uh, this is, yeah, it kind of matches pretty nicely here, but the difference is the scope. Uh, while the scope of an object is a single process, the scope of an actor would be an, the entire distributed system. So here in this image, we can see that we have um, uh, four hexagons and they, are, they represent some processes, different processes in this, uh, in this system. We can imagine them as uh, containers, pods, whatever. And the little circles represent our actors, actor types. So with the different colors represent different uh, actor types and then uh, different instantiations um, of, those, uh, of those actors. As we can see, actors here, in the same color, so the same actor type, do appear on different uh, servers and in different instances. So yeah, the scope of, uh, of an actor is the, is the distributed system, the scope of an object is a process. It's one big difference between uh, the uh, object-oriented programming and the actor model. Fun fact, uh, this is Mr. Alan Kay. Uh, he's the, let's say, the, the father of object-oriented programming and a bunch of other things that uh, you can find in his Wikipedia page. So by some sources, uh, he uh, was uh, inspired, actually, largely influenced by, by the actor model. But by some other sources, Mr. Carl Hewitt, who is the creator of uh, the actor's model, was actually influenced by the, by the object-oriented programming and the small talk language um, where you have a lot of message passes. So I don't, I don't know what <laughs> the truth is here. That's probably somewhere back in the, in the 70s. Mm, but we do know for sure, and it has, uh, has been recorded and documented, that... Um, they did correspond, so they did follow each other's work, and uh, both of them seem to have been influenced by the by the message sending and message uh, passing model. So let's do a quick recap where we are right now. I know this is probably if you have uh, if you haven't worked with actors before and you're not uh, completely um, like you're not familiar with them, maybe it's not completely clear uh, clear just yet. But uh, I hope it will be soon. Quick re recap from now. So we know that actors are, uh, they are stateful objects with defined behavior. So you can specify, go ahead and write in the business, uh, business logic that your actor is going to follow, and they can have a um, uh, uh, state. They process only one message at a time. So we have isolation here. And when I say isolation, I mean like the I in, uh, in asset, like the transactional uh, database property. So this is the same kind of isolation we're talking about if there's multiple messages waiting in, in line to be processed, the actor is going to uh, start get the lock, let's say, start processing that one message, 
um, uh, and when it's done, it's going to release the lock, and then the next message uh, is going to uh, start to be uh, is going to acquire the lock and um, then be processed. So that's a very important property as well. Um, the identity of an actor uh, is defined by their address. They can communicate, so they can send messages, exchange messages to other actors, and also send messages to themselves. And they are instantiated and destroyed explicitly as needed. So when you need an actor, you create it, it has uh, its ephemeral state. When you don't need it anymore, you destroy it. So this was work mostly done, started around the 70s, very visionary, by the way, for that time, because it was already predicting how um, the, the things are going to develop at a large scale. Fast forward 40 years, the second way of, uh, of work on the actor model began, and it came out of the need of uh, optimization. So namely, we're talking about the virtual actor model. So what was the thing here? Uh, as we mentioned before, so we see like uh, the programmer needed to instantiate and destroy actors explicitly, right? So the virtual actor model says, well, why? Why you know, do we need to give that um, responsibility to the programmer? Wouldn't it be better and more um, error resistant if we just made the, our implementation of the actor model uh, take care of that for us? So that, um, then they, uh, uh, they uh, suggested the solution where the system that implements the actor model implementation should actually automatically load and unload the actors on demand um, removing that responsibility from, from the programmer. So then if an actor is loaded or unloaded on demand, then um, this thing that we have like, okay, instantiated actor, destroyed actor, then becomes um, uh, not, not really uh, uh, relevant anymore because an actor can exist an actor ID, right, can uh, exist at any moment. If, it's, if it doesn't exist, it's going to get created automatically, so the user doesn't have to do that. Now, that requirement is great. Um, uh, it definitely is going to save up um, a lot of resources as well, because uh, why would you want to keep an actor instantiated? Uh, wasting resources, right? We should be all contributing <laughs> to um, to the energy management of uh, our planet, mm, uh, where you know it can be uh, unloaded and then uh, we save some um, uh, some memory. Okay, but if we want to load and unload actors on demand, uh, what are we going to do with that state? How can we reload an actor or load an actor if um, we have lost the state in the meantime? So now from that first requirement comes the second property of a virtual actor, which is uh, the state is stored externally in some external um, uh, state store. Um, and this also gives uh, 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 the second benefit, which is not only uh, this is very um, resource efficient, I would say it's very uh, scalable because now if you can load and unload actor, get an actor, move it, like expand your system, scale it uh, twice, three times, fivefold, your actors are going to get rebalanced uh, nicely across that system. So because you can unload them from one place, load them into another and simply uh, um, uh, distribute the balance, uh, the load pro um, properly across um, all of your pods or services. And then another th little thing changed here. So if you remember, we said uh, the identity of the actor is defined by their address. Uh, but we didn't mention, because this is right, the, the regional actors model is just a conceptual thing. It didn't uh, offer an implementation by itself. Obviously, there were some implementations, but the model itself doesn't offer that. And just say that the identity of the actor is their, uh, is their address here. Now, in the virtual actor model, we don't work with addresses because we would have to, like, th there, there, uh, there has to be in an implementation of the, uh, of the original actor model, if you have an address, there has to be then some kind of uh, something, some kind of process that maps that address to a uh, like logical uh, uh, ID address to some kind of physical address, some IP um, process, right? There, there would have to be something, someone else that does that work. 
So the virtual actor model comes and says, well, let's remove also that responsibility from the developer and let's take that uh, on us. Uh, we're going to decide, um, how, uh, we're going to help users uh, find their actors. They don't need to take uh, um, uh, care and uh, keep track of addresses. They only need to keep track of actor type and actor ID. Okay, so an actor type would be um, uh, like the class, right? What we compare to a class. An actor ID would be uh, the identity of that actor class, so kind of like an instantiated uh, class or an object. Okay. Um, and one of the first use cases, I'm sharing this because I think it's quite cool, uh, was actually the Halo 4 game. Uh, they started to see some scaling problems. They started to see millions of uh, daily users playing the, playing the game. So uh, they were one of the first uh, users of the virtual actor model. Okay. Now, Dapper, how does Dapper relate? Uh, where does it stand uh, in the actor world? So Dapper does implement uh, the virtual actor model. Okay, that's a more efficient one, um, where actors have identity, uh, as we said, defined by actor type and actor ID, uh, have methods that can be called, uh, and they are just, if it wasn't clear, so the methods uh, implemented on the actor are actually defined in the user application. So you write those, you specify that's like business uh, uh, logic that you create in your, uh, in your actor class. Actors are single threaded. Uh, uh, the state store uh, you can use in configurable is uh, external, right? Uh, optimized resource utilizations. They can scale into the millions um, uh, and the distribution is done automatically, as we mentioned. We've seen like millions of actors uh, only uh, over only you know, a handful uh, of, of pods. Another interesting thing that uh, actors uh, uh, provide is, as we just mentioned in his talk, like you can schedule reminders and timers on an actor, uh, schedule, uh, schedule a reminder that's going to trigger after like at a certain time or maybe even periodically. And uh, Dapper finally does provide SDK support for most of the biggest languages, and that would include uh, C Sharp Java, JavaScript, Python, and Go. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit uh, and see it right from a, a closer view, closer to the app. Again, the hexagon uh, is going to uh, represent uh, your application, and there's the Dapper sidecar. So as I said, your actors are defined in your application. So be it Python, be it Java, be it Go, uh, the SDK, the SDK uh, gives you the tools. You can go ahead and create your own um, business logic in your, in your actors, uh, following whatever interfaces um, are defined there. So in this example, we're going to work with these two actor types, red and yellow. Red is one actor type, yellow is another actor type, and then we can see that we have actor one, actor one, and actor two. So those are the uh, the IDs. Okay, this is just to explain um, what's the visual nomenclature here. Okay, so you can have multiple instances of your app, right? So again, we are talking about um, uh, being distributed, being scalable. So this is the same actor type distributed across uh, two applications and different IDs uh, have been split across um, uh, different instances. Um, and then we have uh, an application that then makes a call to, uh, to one of the actors. Uh, and that, go that goes um, standardly like from Dapper to Dapper uh, between the pods and then inside of the pods, Dapper communicates to the application as usual. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, how does this application know where to search for, let's say, red actor one or yellow actor one? How does it know it's going to be on the left side and not on the pod on the right side? Well, uh, this is where the placement service come into place, comes into place. The placement service um, is a... a control plane service that can run as a single service or uh, uh, um, uh, in high availability mode. And all Dapper instances connect to it. So all of them, all of the actor instances that, that serve actors are going to report to the placement service. And then the placement service is going to keep this table that explains 
uh, that, that keeps track, it doesn't explain, uh, it keeps track, it uh, 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 shows the mapping of an actor type to the address, let's say in this case, uh, the address of a, of a pod. So it can say that maybe the red actor is hosted on pod one and pod two, the two um, uh, pods on the, uh, the upside, uh, uh, top ones. Um, okay, and then it's gonna know that uh, the yellow actor is hosted only on pod, pod three and so on. So this uh, uh, table is stored in the placement service and then the placement service disseminates this table to all of the dapper instances. When we say disseminate, uh, we use the, a specific terminology, it means just, it just sends uh, the table uh, to every dapper sidecar. So now every dapper sidecar has the information about which actor types are hosted on which pods. This sounds sim simple, but it's not. <laughs> Okay, so all of this has to be uh, very deterministic and very consistent. We cannot have some kind of inconsistent state where one dapper sidecar is going to have one uh, version of the day of the table and another dapper sidecar is gonna, going to have another version of the table. That cannot happen. It's, it's going to really, it, it can really cause problems because if you remember, we have to guarantee isolation, right? An actor can only execute one message at a time. So if our system, by mistake, instantiates the same, the same actor ID on different pods, we can get into a situation where um, uh, we are doing parallel operations, like modifications on the actor state uh, uh, of, of the, of the um, same actor ID, and it wasn't locked properly. So we are, by default, by definition, we are breaking the uh, requirement of uh, isolation, we're processing two, two messages at a time. And then reconciling the state there would be hell. So we can never have a situation of, if, of uh, inconsistent tables. It's a very sensitive uh, thing to get right. And um, uh, the placement service uh, 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 does it very well. Okay, so now when where all the dapper um, uh, uh, sidecars have all the placement tables information, they, it, mean, it means that they can contact and talk to, to other actors. So we can see here these errors represent uh, actor invocations um, across dapper sidecars. So now let's look a little bit deeper into the placement service. How is it implemented? Because I just think it's, um, I mean, you don't know, as a, as a final end user, you don't need to know how that works, but uh, I think it's totally worth it to dedicate a minute or two on it because it's just, uh, I find it cool. Okay, so the placement service, as I said before, can be um, a single server and or it can run in high availability. Default is uh, uh, three pods. Um, every placement service wraps a raft server. So for raft, we use, it, uh, we use the HashiCorp um, uh, implementation. Um, we have, so we have three raft servers then communicating to each other. This would be these uh, blue lines. Those are, they represent the raft peer communication. They're gonna elect a leader. And then all the dapper sidecars are going to connect to that leader. They're gonna try, well, okay, they're gonna connect maybe to a random one, they're gonna try here. If this is not the leader, they're gonna try here. Then finally, they can find the leader and connect to the leader. But uh, the point is, uh, because we need to have complete consistency, uh, we cannot connect to the, to the other placement services. So all the dapper sidecars are going to connect to the leader placement service. Uh, we establish a, a bidirectional gRPC stream. If the dapper sidecar hosts any actor types, on connection uh, is going to send the uh, information about which actor it hosts, actors it hosts. If it doesn't uh, host anything, it's just uh, going to uh, uh, initiate the connection and then when there is a change uh, uh, in the placement table or even the initial uh, table. So the leader is going to distribute or disseminate the placement table to all the dapper, um, dapper sidecars. So how does it do that? First, is if, if there is an update, first it's going to send a lock message to all the dapper sidecars. It's going to lock everything. It's going to send the table and then it's going to unlock um, everything. So it's a little bit of a uh, uh, maybe 
s- slow. Let's call it. it's not slow. It's very fast, obviously, but uh, it's still uh, uh, three messages. So maybe in our world that is um, uh, not a very fast thing to do. But this is indeed necessary if you want to, to have those guarantees that we just talked about before. Okay. Um, so let's go. Uh, maybe let's start uh, looking into an example. Uh, I'm going to mention in the end maybe some like very some more common um, dapper actors use cases, but uh, one we see a lot and uh, we find very uh, very nice for presentations because it's quite easy to understand is the IoT model. So it's very common. And there's many users who use dapper actors for uh, uh, to represent IoT devices. So. In our case here, uh, the IoT device is going to be this smart light bulb here. And this device is controlled by the actor server that has its own like the sidecar, of course. Um, uh, we have a storage layer. And then on the other side, uh, because, I mean, it's not that it's actually a human user, right? It controls the smart light bulb. Uh, light bulb. So uh, the human uh, uses the phone application. Uh, the phone application maybe connects to some kind of uh, uh, backend application for this front end here. And then, then this application um, all, uh, has a dapper sidecar. Uh, and then when a the user clicks the button, hey, turn on the light, that signal propagates to, uh, to the application. The application brings the dapper sidecar. The dapper sidecar, knowing the information about the location of every actor by having the placement table that got from the placement service here, is going to ping directly the dapper that's responsible for that application. Dapper communicates to the application, and the application finally sends a signal uh, to the light bulb, and the light bulb is on. Let there be light. Great. So this looks pretty simple, right? Um, but then what if we have um, millions of these bulbs here? Uh, what happens then? Maybe one server then wouldn't be enough. Really, it could get, start to get a little bit tricky. What happens if we have millions of users using this application? Well, this application here is not going to be enough then either, right? So what do we do? The obvious um, uh, answer, uh, I guess, would be to scale out, scale horizontally. And if we have, you know, all of these then millions of users at the same time trying to switch on and off their lights, or maybe then, and it's not just on and off, uh, like changing colors, um, dim them, program, program them, um, uh, it can get busy. And this is not lights. I mean, lights are maybe even easy because you don't switch your light on and off uh, a, a thousand times a day. But if you're working with some temperature sensors, uh, smart city cameras, speed cameras, traffic lights, um, people flow in a metro station and all kinds of sensors like that, you get a lot more traffic. So all of that, like the scale of that becomes really uh, impressive and formidable. <laughs> you have to um, give it due respect and plan for it, plan for that scale. So um, then how would we do that? This is, this is where uh, um, uh, a model that can be easily distributed, easily scaled out, really helps and really shines uh, because it allows us to distribute this load um, across multiple, uh, multiple servers. So how do you interact with actors? Um, it's actually very simple. They expose uh, HTTP endpoints. So if you want to um, invoke uh, a method uh, on, on uh, uh, an actor of type my actor with the ID of A, this is how the endpoint is going to look like. Um, and version, then actors, and this is the actor type. This is the actor ID. And then we say to call the method update on this sector. And this can be whatever you want. So you define this. Uh, this is, these are the methods that you, you defined on the actor. You can save state, get the state. Um, uh, you can create reminders, create timers. And that's basically, it. it's, a, it's a really simple API. And as I mentioned before, you can, uh, uh, there's also wrappers. You don't need to uh, use uh, uh, like pure HTTP calls. You can use the, uh, the different SDKs. Um, to interact with uh, with actors. Okay, so 
more actors use cases so like we went a little bit deeper maybe maybe not as deep but uh, a little bit in more detail on uh, the IOT actors um, we also mentioned that uh, Halo yeah, used uh, actors as one of the original uh, or earlier maybe not original but earlier definitely earlier um, actor use cases so how would that look like maybe let's take just a moment um, uh, uh, to talk through that so uh, when you have a multiplayer game and you have millions and millions of users, uh, you can have um, the session of each user be represented by an actor. And then uh, there's multiple things that are trying to interact with that actor. So maybe another user is trying to shoot a gun at it. Another user is going to try to push it. And then maybe there is some energy field that is interacting and not in terms of changing its physical location, which is, by the way, a property of the actor. So it is a concurrent request, but maybe it's um, lowering its uh, strength, life, heart, stamina. I mean, I don't know. I'm not really a gamer person, um, but, but yeah, you can use the terminology uh, that you want here. Um, uh, so then there's maybe um, some other user trying to give it, put something else in its inventory. So there can be really a lot of messages, a lot of things, events trying to interact with that uh, same actor. And um, uh, uh, we have to account for race conditions into, into that, right? So that's why the actor model that, that guarantees this uh, isolation and sequential ex execution of messages um, is a really nice way, um, uh, uh, nice solution for this. And then on top of it all, like the scale that, uh, again, uh, it always comes back, the scale. It's a really big deal, really important with actors. Um, uh, it's uh, um, uh, it's a good selling point <laughs> when you're talking about millions and millions of players. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then uh, if you if you have millions of actors that maybe played the game today and then left, you don't want to leave all that uh, uh, memory just hanging around, right? So, uh, with virtual actors, all of that is going to clean up as soon as the uh, the session times out after maybe half an hour, 30 minutes of, um, uh, of uh, the, the player uh, leaving the game, the system is going to kick in and free up that memory so other users maybe uh, can use it and we don't have to vertically scale our system or even horizontally scale our system uh, and provide uh, spend more RAM, right? Um, so I think, I mean, there's a, a, a bunch of stuff here. I'm not going to uh, read through all of them, but it's important that also um, uh, we persist the state to an external store. Um, uh, actors can communicate to each other. Maybe there's like even a, a, a chat between them. So all of that uh, becomes really, really interesting. Um, then even more actor use cases. So we already saw IoT and we talked about the light bulbs. As, uh, I mentioned also uh, that can, it can be uh, um, even more used when you talk about sensors with a lot of data streaming through it um, all the time. It can be used for to define business workflows. I've seen some use cases where people your, use uh, actors even for locking, so they started using them maybe for simple locking, but then they added some behavior on top of it, which is perfectly a valid use case. Um, a state for long, long running services like, uh, yeah, we mentioned game sessions, but I mean, shopping cart sessions. Um, I don't know about you if you complete your shopping in a few minutes, but I sometimes leave my Amazon carts just for a few things to pile up during a week or a few weeks. Uh, and then I create uh, one single order. So in a shopping cart session, is not something uh, uh, yeah, is something that can benefit from actors, like some uh, machine learning, AI processing pipelines, uh, scheduling, as we mentioned, um, uh, automation, like reading big files, moving a lot of data from one place to another. Then it fails. You need to retry. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to someone who had um, uh, a use case like that. Uh, and modernizing existing systems. So it's very common that you have a, uh, an older system uh, that uses a, a, a trans some kind of RDBMS, transactional database, where ACID is really uh, a key property. So transactionality is really important. And sometimes the database cannot really um, support the scale that's needed. So some, in some use cases, maybe 
some of those um, uh, uh, cases can be offloaded, uh, can be solved uh, uh, with an actor. Obviously, we're talking about different scopes here. Uh, when we talk about ACID, that's mm, on the level of a uh, database transaction, right? Uh, <clears throat> single system. Uh, when we're talking about actors, it's on the level of the distributed system, but uh, so it's not exactly the same guarantees. But if you combine it with maybe some, some other things, you can get to a similar result. And my favorite and coolest uh, by far use case out of all is the use case uh, the astronauts in the International Space Station's uh, run. Uh, which is uh, they use Dapper actors uh, to run a model that uh, visually inspects their uh, their gloves, uh, space gloves, <laughs> before uh, them going into uh, into space for some micro tears. Uh, while that process used to take um, a long time in the past, uh, and it was done manually, um, it was um, it is done uh, with Dapper actors uh, right now. Uh, and yeah, it makes us all very proud. It's definitely a cool thing to be able to say, yeah, my code drones in space. Uh, so definitely feels really nice. Okay, uh, thank you all. If we have uh, more time, I can show you maybe some, some code that uh, shows how simple actors are to implement. If not, uh, we can uh, maybe leave a link to the repo later and people can take a look and you can just look at the Dapper quick starts in, in the different uh, SDK libraries um, and uh, uh, yeah, enjoy the beauty of Dapper actors. Thank you.